It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us that bread, always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you, do you have seen me, and yet you do not believe? Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up, raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread of life, come down from heaven. And they were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, you've learned a little bit this morning about what it's like to live in the Fisher house. <laughs> and I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions. But it's a joy to have this person sitting here who plays so beautifully. And it's a joy to be married to somebody who can give you a lecture on Greek. Uh, every morning he greets me with the phrase, Elf karist o hati egerthesis, which is Greek for I give thanks that you have arisen <laughs> better than the alternative. So that, yeah, I, I'm with him on that one. But it's a fun time most often. You never know whether it's going to be Latin or Greek or Swahili or whatever, but um, it'll be something fun, something interesting, and something worth knowing. But now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about the desire to believe. And sometimes when I think about faith, I recall the times when my life was racked by a lack of faith. And in such times, I thought deeply about what it meant to believe in this figure, Jesus. And I wondered if I had properly come to faith, if there is a proper way. Did I believe deeply enough? Did I believe correctly, if there is a correct way? Was my faith connected to and rooted in the doctrine I professed? Or was that merely an ornament or an embellishment? The words and thoughts of a fellow named Chris Myman became the stuff of revelation for me he asked the question, and I think it's a pertinent one. He said, what is it we want when we can't stop wanting? And I thought, wow, that's either profound or silly. <laughs> so you can decide. But wasn't endless, unsatisfied wanting a sign of the lack of faith? 
So Chris, uh, Winman just explores that question at great length in his new book, entitled, He Held the Radical Light, The Art of Faith and the Fate of Art. Winman wrote that book after he had been diagnosed with cancer, which was potentially terminal. And he asked the tough questions that led him to question even the Christian faith and theology. And that caused him to reconsider his faith and probe deeply what belief meant to him. It also connects nicely with our scripture today. We catch up with Jesus when he meets a crowd of people who are desperately hungry. In fact, these folks have been following Jesus around for a number of days. And in John 6, verses 24 through 35, we learn that this is part of a larger story in which Jesus intuits, he just comes to this in his head, that these folks want to be fed and they are counting on Jesus to do it. So in what was one of his first miracles, Jesus manages to transform by five barley loaves and two small fishes into a meal, a meal big enough to feed 5,000 people, which is a trick. And as if that were not enough, Jesus later walks on water to the horror of his disciples who are in a rowboat, and a wild storm is raging at this as, hap as if this is happening. Now Jesus announces his presence by sort of a low key, it is I, do not be afraid. And despite having had a big meal recently, the crowd asks Jesus to feed them again because they are still hungry and would very much like Jesus to repeat the miracle he just performed with the loaves and fishes. So some of the crowd commandeer a boat and they sail to this place called Capernaum where they find Jesus again. And Jesus knows they are following him because they were led to him because of earthly hunger, not because they have seen the signs of multiplying the loaves and fishes into a meal big enough and satisfying enough to feed 5,000 souls. Rather, there is no food in their bellies now now, and they very much would like Jesus to repeat the stunt that he performed earlier so the crowds could eat again. And it's at this point that Jesus admonishes the crowd that their earthly bread only satisfies for a short while. But heavenly bread, the kind that Jesus will give them, will relieve hunger pangs for a long time and heavenly bread will not spoil or lose its capacity to satisfy even with the most persistent hunger and relentless desire. At this point, someone in the crowd says to Jesus, sir, yes, please, let's give, please give us that bread always. To which Jesus replied, and appropriately so, I, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me will not be hungry, and whosoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus then rebukes the crowd for not understanding the simple words he was saying. And in chapter 6, verses 26 to 40, there's a lengthy oration, one might say castigation, from Jesus trying to get through to these people who still cannot fathom the difference between earthly and heavenly bread. The crowd is now addressing Jesus as rabbi, perhaps to curry favor, perhaps to connote respect. And Jesus now offers a lengthy oration on why the bread of life is a superior kind of bread. But the audience keeps peppering Jesus with questions. 
when Jesus tries to deliver his speech in the synagogue at Capernaum, they keep interrupting him. And it seems to represent a turning point in Jesus's ministry. Although the crowd continues to pepper him with more questions, Jesus deliberately doesn't answer them. <clears throat> and although, although the, the answers are really kind of self-evident, Jesus doesn't say anything else. Rather, he gives a lengthy discourse, which was misinterpreted at several points by the crowd. It represented a turning point in Jesus's ministry in that even some of the former disciples were repelled by the strange and lofty mysticism that Jesus's message taught. But there was really no reason to question the bread of life discourse that followed and the miracle of the loaves and fishes. It was a correction of the failure to appease the crowd <clears throat> by its by Jesus's story and the significance of the feast of bread that he offered. But it can hardly be doubted that the whole discourse as it came down to us in scripture had been arranged by Jesus himself so as to bring out the special and often unappreciated teachings of Jesus about his own person and to illustrate the growing opposition of some Jews to Jesus recorded in chapter 6, verse 41. And in chapter 6, verses 6 through 40, we learn about the miraculous feeding of people. The people had seen a sign, or a semion in Greek, which if they had correctly interpreted, faith might have ensued, and the whole effort would have been deemed successful. But the sign had been arranged by John to bring the repeated teachings of Jesus about his own purpose and to illustrate the growing opposition of some of the Jews to Jesus as revealed in chapter six, verse 41. The peoples and the disciples had seen a sign in verses 14 which, if it had been interpreted correctly, would have led to faith being planted in the crowd. But the crowds were following Jesus because of the material benefits. And here you're allowed to think of the loaves and fishes because that's what they wanted. They wanted to be fed. They wanted not to be hungry. And the people discerned that Jesus was the deliverer of their race as it's revealed in the scripture in chapter six, line 30, where people ask him for a miraculous sign. And Jesus has to explain, yes, he can give you a miraculous sign, but the satisfied body that would result from the sign would not last long. And people would fear, feel hunger and hunger pains soon enough, after which their disbelief would return. So, as Jesus said in 627, one should work not for the bread which perishes, even as manna from heaven perishes. And we talked about that last week. So don't go for that bread. Rather, one should work for spiritual food which endures. Jesus also wondered why people would spend good money and work very hard for food that won't last and in the end doesn't satisfy. But the ability to satisfy is a property of spiritual bread upon which stress is laid throughout several verses in chapter six, and these include 35, 50, 54, and 58. He's really trying to drive this point home. Earthly bread does not satisfy. Spiritual bread does. So he makes the case rather emphatically that the ones who eat the spiritual bread 
will have the power of God's Son invested in them, and they will never die. Never die. However, this kind of power was downplayed by the church at that time, and people there lived in fairly tumultuous times and were forced to deal with the early Christian church, which had an intense interest in the book of Revelation, and that taught that the end times were imminent. Furthermore, the vivid apocalyptic imagery of Revelations resonated well with Christian eschatological or end times thinking. And it provided hope and encouragement to believers facing persecution and hardship that their earthly trials would soon be over. Its portrayal of God's revelation in, prefer excuse me, in preference to redemption allowed the church to defend its core doctrines and resisted deviations from the faith. So despite a rocky reception, the church was victorious, earning the security of the church universal and surviving intact for centuries. Now, if we return to the poet Winman by asking the question, what do we want when we can't stop wanting? What Winman seemed to mean is that wanting what we cannot have is part of human nature. To be human means to long for more than what daily bread provides. Humans long for big things like meaning, ultimacy, salvation. And there's an upside to this need. For instance, it inspires the artist, the musician, and the poet to achieve greatness. It inspires scientists to reach beyond the boundaries of the known world and discover new, previously unways to treat disease, for instance. And this restless creativity, in essence, defines us as humans. And I believe that that penchant, that creativity, was created in us by God. In fact, I would say we do need bread, but we are equally dependent on the bread of life. Amen.